follow. And in some ways, I think it sets it up perfectly to actually be thinking about those issues of conflict, and it is often perceived as ethnic conflict, but actually when we dig a little bit deeper, we see that there's actually a lot of other issues going on. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, Central Asia. And my talk today is really gonna focus on three key questions. Number one, given the history of Central Asia as an integrated region, why isn't there more cooperation? Then point number two, can we say that the concerns about conflict, is it due to the challenges of international water law? And then three, there's a new framework that some colleagues uh, at MIT and Tufts have developed called the Water Dis Diplomacy Framework, and I think in some ways resonates a lot with this idea of a non-zero-sum way of thinking about problems uh, and using a negotiated approach. So first, where, where are we uh, with the first question of why isn't there greater cooperation? So when we think about Central Asia, we're really talking about the five former republics of the Soviet Union, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and uh, Kyrgyzstan. And I'm also going to be speaking about a particular region where 20% of Central Asians live, Fergana Valley, which is actually situated in between Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And if you look at any of the reports around Central Asia, it's really this area that people are saying is going to be a source of great conflict. So a colleague, Bakit Beshimov, who's a well-known Kyrgyz scholar and actually political uh, dissident, who's now in the US, and was an associate editor of this book on Fergana Valley, really posed this question to me. Why isn't there greater cooperation? Because it's historically had an integrated economy. You actually have close cultural ties between communities. And frankly, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, you also had a host of agreements and mechanisms in place that in theory should provide the framework for cooperation. I think to understand the question of the integrated historical economy, we actually need to go all the way back to the Russian Empire and the growing demand for cotton. And in fact, it was the US Civil War that interrupted the supply of cotton and led the Russians to realize that they want to have their, their own fields of cotton and realize that the Aral Sea Basin, which uh, Aaron talked about, was actually a very good climate for growing cotton, in particular in the plains of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan. And in addition, they had a labor force, a chief labor force in the form of Central Asians to actually pick this laborious crop. Fast forward to the Soviet Union, the Cold War provides even greater emphasis for the renewed effort in uh, growing cotton. And in particular, cotton not only reduced the Soviet Union's de dependence on Western supplies, it was also really considered a form of white gold because it was a commodity that could easily be sold on the open market. Now, when you look at the geography of this region, the Aral Sea Basin really has two main rivers that are going through it. Up north, you have the Sirdaria, starting in Kyrgyzstan, going through Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And then you have the Sirdaria, which actually starts in Afghanistan, though Afghanistan is not a party to any of the agreements and was not officially part of the uh, Soviet Union. But it travels through Tajikistan and then onward south to the Aral Sea. Now, if you take a look at that geography, you'll see that the upstream countries of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are mountainous. And this is really a key part of the equation that we see plays out today. The Russians use the mountainous terrain of a place like Kyrgyzstan to build dams, like the Toktobil Dam, where the, the stated purpose was really for controlling the flow of water for irrigation. So water was collected during the year and released during the high growing season of the spring and summer. Now notably, this particular dam also has the capacity for, to produce hydroelectric power, but that was a secondary function. Now, because the hydropower was not being produced in the winter time, they were not releasing the water in the winter time, which is when you would actually need it for electricity, they were relying on the energy rich downstream countries that are rich in natural gas and energy uh, and oil for actually kind of an, a, a, a barter arrangement, essentially. So we return back to our main question. So we were just looking at kind of the historical integration of the region, culturally similar. Now, the five nation states that exist really follow the Soviet republics. 
And in many ways, you have to make a distinction between ethnicity and nationality. Because although, for example, Kyrgyzstan does have majority uh, Kyrgyz people, there are also large groups of Uzbeks and Tajiks living there. And so there's a distinction made between ethnicity and nationality. And in particular, in the Fergana Valley region, this area that I said 20% of the population lives, you've had, even after 1991, even after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, actually somewhat fluid borders between these three. And if you take a look at that geography, you'll notice that there are these small little enclaves, they're called. This is a really unique geographic picture, which in some ways adds context to the concern about conflict. You have, for example, that uh, the, the circled little enclave is actually a sovereign piece of Uzbekistan that is sitting in the middle of Kyrgyzstan is not, there, there's no corridor there, but it's actually populated by the majority of Tajik people. So you can imagine that this is quite a, uh, a complicated scenario, but yet there are, there are researchers, in particular political geographer uh, Nick Megarin, who's done some really fascinating work in the area and has basically said, look, for about the first decade after uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, you actually had these communities living like they historically had, where you could have a village that was a, a Uzbek house here and a Kyrgyz house here. And if you just read that caption, I just love it. It basically says, one villager in Tajikistan says, this is Tajikistan. Kyrgyzstan is on the other side of that donkey. <laughs> so that gives you a sense, uh, up until about a decade ago, this was life in Fergana Valley. Then as I mentioned, there are agreements and actually a mechanism in place. So in 1991, dissolution of the Soviet Union, the countries realized that cotton was such a dominant crop that there was an incentive in particular for the downstream countries to actually ensure that the, uh, the integrated economy that was developed under the Soviet Union continued so that they would all manage to sustain economically. And so basically the flows on the two main rivers that lead to the Aral Sea were maintained as they were under the Soviet era. And it's generally just called the 1992 uh, Almaty Agreement because that's where it was signed. In addition, most people know about the Aral Sea because it has become a symbol of environmental degradation. If you look here, these are the borders of the Aral Sea, the, the line around. And the size of the sea has shrunk dramatically. And this has been a huge cause of concern internationally and even locally. And if you look, you know, the, the, there was actually once strong fishing villages that are now sitting in the middle of the desert. It has all kinds of health impacts in terms of just dust storms and de de desertification. But these five countries, former Soviet republics, created an organization, the International Fund on the Aral Sea. They also created the Interstate Commission for Water Coordination of Central Asia, which actually has the kinds of basin organizations that you were referring to, right? And uh, including the BVOs, which are essentially your basin organizations. This is, in theory, the mechanism by which that if you were to look on paper, you would say, why isn't there greater cooperation here? Um, but the reality is, is there isn't. And so although you've got meetings uh, that are taking place, what you see if you actually, that countries are sometimes boycotting them. You have headlines, politicians, who, do, who are they speaking to, but essentially in this case, Uzbekistan being concerned about recent dam building by upstream countries, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. And even the US in particular, I think, uh, because of Afghanistan, you see a lot more interest in the Amudariya because its headwaters are really in Afghanistan. And identifying in a recent US uh, global intelligence report on water, this is an area of concern. So now let's ask the question, what role does international water law have here? And, and is that part of the solution or part of the problem? So I'm sure you're all familiar with basically the basic tenets of international water law codified into the 1997 UN Water Courses Convention. And I think the two primary principles that most people focus on is the first of equitable and reasonable utilization, and then taking appropriate steps to prevent significant harm. Now, there is some literature on this, and in particular this one article that goes through and looks at both the Almaty Agreement that locked in those Soviet era allocations, and also the statute that created that uh, coordinating body. 
and basically says, look, it reflects international law to agree. I would say that as a textual matter, I would actually disagree with that interpretation. I think if you look closely at the text, you don't see international law does give you some flexibility, and I think the actual agreements are, are more rigid. And in particular, um, the taking appropriate steps to prevent significant harms, you see, for example, the 92 agreement basically saying um, not allowing any harm. So the flexibility that's there, you don't actually see in the agreements. But I would suggest to you that even if the texts were slightly more flexible and in fact incorporated international water law to a better degree, you would still be in the same challenges, mainly because of the fact that you have agreements that are locking in what is very much perceived to be uh, unfair allocations, in particular by the upstream countries. So if you just take a minute and look at those numbers, you'll see that the upstream countries get very a very small amount of the actual flows. But this graph shows you that the flows, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, the vast majority of the flows actually originate in those countries. But the vast majority of the abstraction, the red columns, is happening downstream. Moreover, the original arrangement under the Soviet Union depended on this water energy nexus. The fact that you had cheap natural gas and oil going from the downstream countries, that broke down for a variety of reasons, including the fact that uh, all of the countries had difficult uh, economic times, and it was difficult for Uzbekistan to be continuing, for example, to be sending cheap natural gas to Kyrgyzstan. As a result, this is a map of Kyrgyzstan showing you the start of the Sirdaria River. And the Toktogul Dam that I mentioned before that was built in the 70s by the Soviets. Kyrgyzstan, it's cold in the winter. And, there's a, and they did not have energy for basic heat. So what are they going to do? They're going to use the resources that they have available to them. And they began running the Toktogul Dam in the wintertime. Well, what do you think happened? They're flooding downstream Uzbekistan. And in addition, come spring, come summer, there's not enough water to actually irrigate the crops. So this is, uh, you wind up seeing basically national policies not being, being taken in just the way that Aaron was describing, not in a way that's really thinking about the whole picture. And for Kyrgyzstan, it's really a matter, I would say, of the timing of the flows as opposed to actual allocations. For Tajikistan, it's all because it has a greater capacity to grow cotton, you also see concerns about the actual allocation of funds. What's really fascinating is about within the last decade, Kyrgyzstan passed law actually commodifying water, essentially saying that, look, the flows originate in our territory. We're going to charge for that water. And I think there's some really kind of interesting questions to ask there about, well, is this really consistent with equitable and reasonable utilization? Well, on the one hand, perhaps if, if that they're really talking about charging for the dam upkeep, since the Toktogul Dam really is about maintaining infrastructure really that's benefiting downstream Uzbekistan, or is there a distinction between that and charging for the actual water? And is that bringing us back to the Hartman Doctrine of really thinking about the territorial sovereignty of your water? Another kind of interesting question is, for those of you who know that the big push in the last couple of decades, especially after the Dublin Principles, is thinking about water having an economic value. It's something that is uh, promoted in the domestic context. If you take this context across borders, uh, it that does it really hold consistently? So sort of some interesting questions there. And once again, Uzbekistan, although natural gas exports are increasing, still sixth largest producer of cotton in the world, uh, third largest exporter. Once again, it is still pursuing a policy that is very reliant on cotton and perhaps not really consistent with this idea of thinking about the basin equitably and reasonably. And experts in the region will say, look, these agreements there's no way that they're going to stay. And even the commission itself recognizes that it's powerless in many ways, not only because it's not funded appropriately, uh, not only because it's not really officially recognized by the countries, but there's a host of other reasons. But I would say that if we dig a little bit deeper, there's actually some things that are even going on behind the scenes. Now, the common story is that it's because this is really about ethnic conflict. 
that the, the concern about resources is really because there is, and the, the reality is there is conflict in the region. In particular, in Fergana Valley, you have had violent skirmishes taking place for political reasons. This is an image from just a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and also local level skirmishes that we're going to see really have to do with control and access over land. And not, so ethnicity is part of the equation, but I think it'd be a mistake to say that that is really why conflict's happening. And in terms of thinking about this, the kind of analytical framework that I'm using to think about this is the water diplomacy framework, which is really thinking about a negotiated approach to complex water problems. And let me just say that this is building on a, uh, that this framework really enters a, a long literature on how to think more about it. And of course, we have to start when I was delighted to know I was following Aaron because, I mean, he's really one of the people that really put this, this on the map and thinking about conflict and cooperation. Zaytun and Miramachi's work, thinking about that conflict and cooperation are often happening side by side. Miramachi's work on uh, twins analysis. Deli Prescoli's work on thinking about a continuum of negotiated solutions. Sarah and Gray's work on benefit sharing. There's not time, and we could spend all lecture just going through any one of these doctrinally. I just want to say that you know the, the water diplomacy framework, I think, is yet another, in many ways, builds on these approaches and is another lens through which to really be thinking about the complex social, political power dynamics that are really at play when we're talking about a natural resource like water. So, I'm going to walk through some of the basic points about the framework. So first is acknowledging key assumptions. Water is a flexible resource. That if I can have a run of the river hydroelectric dam that then is you're able to use for irrigation, we've actually created use water twice. We can think about it flexibly. Um, and that we often have this idea, and in many ways, both the key assumptions and these ideas about recognizing that we need to manage water in a non-linear way, that there's feedback, that it's a dynamic cycle, that there's social and political uh, factors that are interplay. I would say for people who are trained in law or the social sciences, you may say, well, well this makes sense. What's the big insight here? And I realize that this is really speaking to the engineering community. And in many ways is, many of you are probably familiar with the common paradigm of water resources management is integrated water resources management. And in many ways, what they basically say in the water diplomacy framework is, look, one of the core underlying assumptions is that you can have a rational way of thinking about managing a basin in a sort of systematic way. And if you just can understand the different inputs, you can develop a rational system. And what they basically say is very similar to what Aaron was saying before is, look, there's a lot of irrationality that's happening here. There's a lot of different pieces at play. And we really need to understand, first map out what's there, and also understand who's at the table. Understand who are the stakeholders, and international law, and really all political negotiations are only thinking about nation states. But nation states don't necessarily represent all the interests of the population, and there's lots of other international actors. We saw the, the slides around international aid. Um, and part of it is in thinking about to actually getting to a an effective negotiating solution when you're in the room of, of angry people and conflict. How do you actually facilitate joint fact-finding, adaptive management, non-zero-sum thinking? So began thinking about this region and in Central Asia, who are the other stakeholders and what are really their interests? And I think first we have to start perhaps with the, the geopolitical interests. This is an area of the world where basically the former and growing emerging superpowers all have strategic interests. The US in particular because of Afghanistan. Uh, Russia is you know, funding, for example, construction in, in Kyrgyzstan now. In part, it kind of has an interesting power dynamic with Uzbekistan. China is uh, interested with what's going on with its borders. Uh, as I mentioned, this is, uh, you see Senate reports happening where Central Asia, which I don't think before it was really, most probably most Americans didn't even know where it was, is all of a sudden something that uh, is really at the forefront. Energy, uh, huge interest in the natural gas and, and uh, oil that's there. Thinking about stakeholders who are actually pushing 
different forms of political economy. So in the fall, collapse of the Soviet Union, Kazakhstan actually really embraced the kind of market liberalization, uh, privatization, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to a certain degree. Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan still largely have pretty closed economies. And I think these tensions, we don't have time to go into them, but I would say are also impacting the actual national strategies of, and where water is a critical piece of that. Terrorists, a huge point of conflict is the fact that you have armed militants, and in particular the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, that Uzbekistan is saying, look, they were in parts of the enclaves in Kyrgyzstan. They're basically saying, look, they were using that as a host to basically launch attacks into Uzbekistan. And if you remember the article that I mentioned with the picture with the donkey, that picture was, I think, in the late 90s. Just a few years later, after these armed incursions, you wound up having borders, militarized borders created and villages bisected. Now, this has huge, huge, huge repercussions. So imagine that your family, the place where your family is, your father was buried, is actually now on the other side of a fence. You now have border agents with a tremendous amount of power, and so you have smuggling, and mainly, which can, could be legitimately illicit black market, but it could also be, look, your farm or your business is actually now on the other side of the fence, but you're not able to get through the border agents every time they're harassing you, or you need to go back to your capital, which is not close, to actually get the necessary permits to cross, essentially, the street. So in many ways, it is worsening an already pretty tough economic condition. And in addition, you know, your joke about sort of Oregon and Washington, this is, this is a real issue there in terms of where these borders are locally. And you have, for example, in the South, if you look in the sort of Kyrgyz newspapers, there's concern about creeping migration, that essentially Tajik people are buying up farms of Kyrgyz people who are moving to Russia or other places in search of work because there's not work locally. And on the one hand, you could say, well, this, this is kind of rational. But it's also interpreted in the media as, look, the Tajikistan is trying to push its borders into Kyrgyzstan. So this concern about creeping, creeping migration, as in the borders slowly creeping in. Even when you look um, at some interesting work that's done uh, in the, on Central Asia, looking at water issues, and this was an article that ex uses that twins framework that thinks about the spectrum of cooperation intensity and conflict intensity and actually maps out on a trajectory how the relationships deteriorated and then got better, you see at this really low point actually corresponds chronologically when also the, the heightening of the border with the, the terrorism incursions in. So you see that you know, even in terms of how that the way the countries are in, interacting vis-a-vis -vis water in some ways is influenced by what else is happening in the region. Farmers, another huge stakeholder. Now if you think under the Soviet era there were big collective farms. And to a certain degree, in certain countries like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, you still have a certain degree of cooperative, collective type farming arrangements. Kyrgyzstan's actually completely privatized their farms. Well, all of a sudden, not only do you have more people turning to the land, because there's just not other jobs and people are looking for a way to survive, but you've also got just canals that were built with kind of these collective farms in mind. Now, lots of different people are trying to figure out how do they share this water. Really interesting work done by Christine Bichel, who did an empirical analysis of uh, irrigation conflicts and the role of multilateral groups, aid agencies in the region. And you know, I, I copied in this little map here, and you can't really see it. But the point is, is that you wind up having these canal systems where they are bisecting national borders. And so you have this upstream-downstream dynamic happening at the local level. And one of her main insights is these conflicts are really about territory and location and geography. Those often overlap with ethnicity and kinship, but, but that's secondary. It's really the fact that people that are downstream are not getting as much water as those upstream. In addition, uh, she also does an interesting kind of critique and analysis of the role of various aid agencies in the region that basically had as their mission peace building. And it was basically peace building through things like joint irrigation projects, 
And the main critique is that you know these projects are working well, but is the assumption that it's all because we just need these different ethnic groups to work together. And in addition, she points out that some of the ideology that we could say is sort of shifting and shaping national priorities is also this kind of idea around economic liberalization and uh, kind of market approaches, which not all of the governments are conducive to. But yet, what has also been pointed out by, by uh, other scholars is that conflict is often happening alongside cooperation. And so you wind up having, uh, this was an interesting piece on meso-level cooperation. So when you actually, the engineers that are responsible for fixing canals actually have to figure out, well, how do I actually cross this border <laughs> if part of my responsibility is actually now on the other side of the border. And so kind of informal ways of trying to work with border agents and actually figure out how to, how to cooperate because, as I pointed out, you're reaching a point of conflict and water is so critical in this region. Um, another really interesting dynamic is understanding the local politics. So in many ways, Fergana Valley, this region that has been you know, kind of the hotbed of conflict, I learned in, in talking with Bakit Beshimov, who was the, the Kyrgyz scholar I mentioned before, that in many ways, this is kind of an ostracized region vis-a-vis -vis their national capitals. And that in some cases, it's because it's the political opposition. In, in, um, in other cases, it's just that the, the capitals are not necessarily always on good terms with the local leaders in this region. Now, why I think that's important, it's because I think that there are, there are issues that could be solved locally by the Aksakal, the elders in the region. There are border disputes that locally leaders might be able to negotiate amongst themselves informally, but oftentimes they're having to go back to their capitals to get permission. And in many ways, the story, I think, begins to morph and kind of emphasizes the differences along ethnicity. And because in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union, you had each of these countries really trying to reclaim their cultural identity, falling, going back to ancient myths that defined their people. And I think what you see happening as well is that local skirmishes, perhaps through journalists or poly, what have you, the narrative is changed in such a way that you are emphasizing differences as opposed to the potential locally for cooperation. So in terms of thinking back to, we just went through a whole series of different actors that are actually uh, have interest in this region, as well as thinking about their different interests. And in many ways, when we think about maybe not who was officially going to be at the bargaining table or at the negotiating table, but who are stakeholders that we should really be thinking about that, that maybe some, somehow need to be part of the dialogue. Uh, and they range, as I said, all the way from the international down to the local. I also put up there as a stakeholder the environment. So that's not one that I've spent a lot of time talking about, but is clearly a, a huge concern vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Aral Sea, vis-a-vis -vis what's, what's happening there, um, and often maybe doesn't get a voice at the table, except perhaps through some of the international community. And then a whole series of, of issues that crop up, ranging from differing uh, political interests, land pressures, migration, and my kind of thinking through all of this and thinking through all these different stakeholders would say that the biggest challenge here is this lack of trust. That you have, in fact, formal mechanisms in place that could provide the kind of mechanism for cooperation, for adaptive management, for joint fact-finding, but that you have all of these other forces pushing on the system, pushing on the nation states, that you fundamentally do not have trust in the system. And even the fact that, that the two uh, river basin organizations are both based in Tashkent and Uzbekistan, that alone is enough for some of the countries to say it's biased towards Uzbekistan. So in terms of thinking back through kind of our, our the three questions, you know, there, there is a history here that suggests there should be a role for cooperation. That international law is part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole piece. That really thinking through how do we get non-zero-sum thinking, how do we actually really bring all of these different stakeholders and the various social, political interests that are intersecting with water management. That's really, I think, the critical piece. Um, would be very interested um, in feedback now or later, because this is a piece that 
Uh, I'm currently writing up, uh, and I want to acknowledge my co-author, Fatima Mendekulova, uh, who is from Kyrgyzstan, and it's, it's because of her that I kind of have now know a lot about this region. Um, and I'm hoping at some point to actually go and do some interviews with some local officials there to kind of flesh out this story. So with that, let me say thank you. Once again, we have a few moments for questions, few minutes for questions. So anyone have a question for Sean? Lots of photographs. <laughs> 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 The one point that, that you touched briefly on, I, I think it may be more central than you touched on, is the exchange of water and gas. And the idea mm. behind those two is that um, uh, Kyrgyzstan, as I understand it, didn't start charging for water willy-nilly. It was when the Soviet Union broke, before the Soviet Union, those two resources were flowing without charge in both directions, gas in one direction, water in the other. And it's, it's really kind of interesting um, conceptual challenge to say, of course, when the, when there were borders, Uzbekistan decided to start charging for natural gas. Mm -hmm. And you think, of course, because that's the kind of thing you charge for. And it was in response to that that both Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan said, oh, OK, well, we'll charge for water. Because that had been the agreement. And, and again, in, in, instinctively, you kind of bought and said, wait, you can't charge for water, except as you say, maybe for storage, maybe for mm -hmm. something else. But it's thinking about well, what is the difference between the two, and I can't put my finger on it. Maybe you have thought through it more and, and, and can flesh that out. Yeah, no, I think that that's I think that that's exactly right. This kind of in the water energy nexus, right? Yeah. And whether it was free or highly subsidized, you're exactly right that that this integrated economy depended on the exchange of energy for water. Um, and I think it's all in some ways. Um, so the two talus between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan is now sort of seen, it's another river that flows, starts in Kyrgyzstan, flows through Kazakhstan to the north, 